Hi, welcome to Talking Cars. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm Kelly Funkhauser. And as you can tell, we're not actually coming from the tra track at Exum Reports in Central Connecticut. We're in a different place. And we are here with a special guest. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is David Ayler. I'm the Vice President of Active Safety uh, at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. And you're right, we're not in Central Connecticut. We're actually in Central Virginia um, at our Vehicle Research Center uh, where we test and evaluate cars. Uh, crash tests like what you see behind us, as well as evaluate crash avoidance features. All right, well, thank you so much for having us here. Um, we just all witnessed a actual crash test here. Um, we don't have a lot of those up at the track, or at least we try not to have those. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what we just saw? Yeah, so we're here in our crash hall, um, and we just conduct conducted our updated side impact. So we run a barrier that's uh, like a car or SUV at 37 miles per hour into the side of a vehicle. Today we evaluated the Kia Seltos. Uh, we have a driver occupant as well as a, a rear seat occupant. And we look at how the vehicle is able to protect those occupants um, in terms of the structure, but also we look at the injury numbers. And that's how we come up with uh, our side impact ratings. We evaluate vehicles uh, based on the performance, whether it's good, acceptable, marginal, or poor. So now you're really kind of go through and try to figure out really what it did. I and mean, we were kind of looking at the car and you could see the damage, but I guess without that expertise to understand what actually did to the occupants, it's hard to say right now whether or not it did well or not. Yeah, so we'll this afternoon look at the dummy injury numbers. So risk of injury to head or to the, the torso, the ribs. We'll also measure the intrusion. So we look at the, the B pillar, which is really designed to help prevent intrusion um, and we'll see how far that uh, structure intruded um, and you know there's more risk of injury the more intrusion we see. Now, now Kelly, um, obviously consumers care a lot about safety. Can you talk a little bit about how we're incorporating some of this information to our information? Absolutely. Reports? So you may not know all of this but we really rely on the work yeah. that is done here at the Vehicle Research Center. So all of the crash tests that you do, of course, we don't crash our We try hard to not crash our cars, <laughs> actually. You do that here. And so we take the data, the scores that you all come up with for each of the cars, and we incorporate them back into our score. So we incorporate the crash tests. We incorporate your automatic emergency braking performance tests. Mm -hmm. And we also recently started incorporating your headlight performance tests, too. So we really rely on all the good work you do here and it does get put back into our scores to give you consumers a really comprehensive look at the car. So crash worthiness is also part of that score. So absolutely, when it comes to our ratings, we, we hear from consumers all the time, like really top of that list is safety. They care about safety. And the question is, we were just talking about this too, it's like, what do people mean by safety? And obviously there's different pieces of it. Certainly there's the crash protection, but now more than ever, it's a lot of what is going to enable you to not get into that crash. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that's changed some of the stuff that you guys are looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So this facility has been here since the early 90s. You know, we have this crash lab. It's, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. So we've been crashing cars for many years. Um, and you know, about 10 years ago, we started seeing the crash avoidance features, the features that help break for you to keep you out of a crash. Uh, we saw they, they were highly beneficial in the real world. And so we started using our covered test track um, as well as our outdoor test track to evaluate how systems help drivers avoid crashes. And so we've looked at autonomous emergency braking um, with other vehicles. Um, we've also looked at how these systems can respond and break for pedestrians during the day and at night. Um, and most recently, we started looking at how these systems can prevent crashes with motorcycles and large trucks. And so, you know, early on, we were just looking at what we call crash worthiness. If you're in a crash, you know, how can the vehicle protect you? Um, last 10 or 15 years, we started looking at, you know, how can the car help prevent you from being in a crash at all? And that's what we call crash avoidance. Right. The best crash is no crash at all. Right. Yeah, if there is right. a best crash, it's to avoid it at all. And and even just avoid it. But if you are going to have the impact, maybe you're at a high rate of speed, those technologies can even mitigate the effects, the severity of those crashes too, taking some of the speed off and things like that. So 
avoiding the crash is the goal. So certainly we're very interested in that stuff too. And obviously we've been looking at things like automatic emergency braking, pedestrian detection, headlights as well. Um, how about Kelly, can you talk a little bit about just kind of how we're utilizing the IHS information and our stuff and how we work together? Because we're not yeah. competitors at all, but we're just kind of trying to figure out how we could both move the market together. Yeah, that's right. Like safety is not a competition. We are collaborators on this and we try to work together to move the market as much as possible especially when you know sometimes those regulations are a little far behind in terms of what right. they're asking for a performance or just getting the technology onto cars. So IHS and NHTSA several years ago kind of authored this, what we call voluntary agreement, where we tried to get all the automakers to say, I pledge to put this technology, automatic emergency braking, onto our cars by this date. We've helped with that, we've been tracking the data and, and compliance, right? Who is, who's ahead and who's still falling behind in terms of putting that equipment on. But recently, you know, some of the news that has come out is that NHTSA is finally creating a law. They've come out with some rulemaking that will require vehicles to have this life-saving technology on their cars. Still a few years out, right? So, so David, can you explain, you know, how we're getting the automakers to get it on their cars before they're actually required to by, by law. Yeah, so I mean, I think both of our organizations are highly influential when it comes to manufacturers, right? And, and getting manufacturers to equip these systems on vehicles, making them standard, making them perform you know, to a certain level. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a little frustrating that this new law you know, is gonna take five years. Um, you know, we think it's a good idea making these systems standard, but in those five years, I think organizations like ours can work together and, and make sure that it's not just minimum standards, that they're working for pedestrians during the day and at night and working for motorcycles. And so I think it's up to us to really get that message out to consumers so that they know what's available, but also really sort of push manufacturers a little bit further than they would normally go um, with these type of systems. Well, I'm going to take, I'm going to take notice of what you said. Uh, safety isn't a competition, certainly not between us, but safety should be a competition between the automakers. We want to see them compete to Best make the course. safest vehicles, right. and I think we're helping push that market. One question I want to have for you to really talk about a little bit about Hildi. So on your shirt, it's IIHS, it's also HLDI. And, you know, there are so many safety features, right? And some of them, maybe they're gimmicks, some of them could be, you know, advertising, some are really lifesavers. And we really depend on you guys to help figuring out really on the market what's making the change. So you want to tell us a little bit about the HLDI? Yeah, so version. HLDI stands for the Highway Loss Data Institute. And it's like a sister organization of ours sponsored by insurance companies. And they're able to sort of track um, data and crashes that may be happening. And so one of the things we did early on was when a lot of these systems were optional, you know, we could compare how effective the systems were for the same vehicle with and without the technology. And so that's how we found early on uh, automatic emergency braking was reducing front to rear crashes by 50%. And right. at that point we said, you know, we need to promote this. We need to make sure manufacturers are putting it on vehicles. And so we're able to do similar studies like that. We can look at you know, how effective it is at reducing pedestrian type crashes. Um, and so, you know, we continue to look at that real world data to find out which one of these systems are effective and, and how we can promote them um, and get manufacturers to, you know, implement that technology. And make more them quickly. better. And so one thing I want to add, right, is that some of the laws and uh, other standards that are out there set the minimum bar, right, to be roadworthy in the United States and elsewhere. But programs like yours and ours, we're upping that bar, right? So we're giving credit and recognition to automakers when they exceed that minimum standard. Yep. And that's how you differentiate. So maybe all of the vehicles now have a feature, but some are still gonna perform better than others. And that's the bar that we're all working together to up. Yeah, and, and we're always trying to you know up that bar. And as I mentioned, you know we started looking at AEB at 12 and 25 miles per hour, right? We added pedestrian. Now we're looking at speeds you know up to 43. Um, the test we saw today is another example. We, we had a side impact test since about 2004, um, but what we saw, it was highly effective at, at preventing fatalities and injuries, but there were still crashes, side impacts happening, and often they were at higher speeds. And so we have an updated side impact that, you know, is at a higher speed, again, to continue to push those manufacturers just a little bit further. Right. Yeah, we just keep on talking about raising the bar, raising the bar. And, and that's what you guys are really doing very effectively. And it's very powerful because you see, you know, you make the test a little bit harder and then 
not many might could do. And we, we talked about that too. It's like sometimes, you know, a new test will come out and not a lot are doing well. It doesn't mean necessarily those are cars to avoid that they're unsafe. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how your raising standards kind of comes yeah. out to the consumer information? Yeah, yeah, manufacturers work really hard at making safer vehicles. And, sure. you know, for instance, the, the most recent release we had um, with automatic emergency braking, you know, only one vehicle was good. Um, but of the 10 small SUVs we evaluated, you know, they were all, they all did well in our previous test. The other tests, yeah. Right. yeah. And so it's not that they're suddenly less safe. It's right. just now that we've raised the bar, we right. have a new test, new requirements. We're seeing some of the differences in that new test. Right. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about top safety pick and top safety pick plus and what that really means to consumers? Yeah. So, you know, as we've talked about, we have several different tests. We have side impact, we have frontal, we have our crash avoidance test with uh, automatic emergency braking. And so, what we do is we sort of wrap all those up and we have what we call our top safety pick awards. We have the top safety pick plus, and we have just our sort of regular top safety pick. And it's really something manufacturers can strive for um, to do well in all of our tests. And then consumers can look at the ratings and say, you know, I, I want a car that performs well, that's a top safety pick plus. Um, we see it in a lot of advertising, you know, from manufacturers. Um, and so basically it requires top ratings in all of the tests we run to win those awards. Our top safety pick plus award requires a good or acceptable rating in our new um, front test, which includes a rear occupant. Um, you have to have a good rating in our side impact and our small overlap. Um, and then you also have to have a good or acceptable rating in our front crash prevention, our AEB test, as well as our headlight test. And then our lower tier award, um, the only difference there is that we're not requiring our new front crash or our new um, moderate front test in that requirement right now. Um, and so it allows manufacturers a little bit more time to sort of move up to that plus award. And we continue to change those again to, to raise the bar. Well, there's certainly a lot of information when it comes to safety on each one of the cars. And on our site, we have a lot of information, certainly from you. There's also information from the government. Kelly, in terms of a consumer who's looking at the safety information, is there some guidance that you want to talk about, like how people could look at that and how it could help them? Yeah, so there's a lot of information out there. Just like IHS has top safety pick, top safety pick plus, we have recommended status kind and of for our top cars picks. too. Top that's picks, like, that's exactly. People. We have top picks, we recommend cars. And um, we have additional criteria beyond the stuff that you have, crashworthiness, all that stuff, new features, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, all of those go into our tests they go as into well. The and yeah. so there's a lot of information out there. In addition to that, we do have NHTSA, so National uh, Highway Transportation Safety Administration. They also do ratings as well. So you may have seen some of the, the stars on like the window sticker when you go car shopping. Maybe we can talk about the difference between those crash tests and star ratings and what, what you guys are doing here too, to explain that. Yeah, so you know there are lots of sort of consumer information out there and the, the five stars that you're talking about, that's um, you know, the federal government's new car assessment program um, where they you know, evaluate vehicles based on the stars. Um, you know, and even before that, a lot of these cars, there are standards that they have to meet, right? right? And just minimum standards, minimum. um, you know, and, and your ratings, our ratings, the star ratings, those are things that sort of go a little bit above and beyond. And so all of us are trying to sort of push in a little bit different areas to make cars as safe That's as possible. That's the key is the different areas. We're not yeah. trying to replicate or compete again. Yeah. We're, we're trying to do it to give consumers and automakers the best information possible. Well, I mean, I think we're all trying to make the fleet better. We're all trying to make better products for consumers, right. including the automakers. Absolutely yep. want to do that. Their business interests are that. I think the difference is really, you know, like you said, if you look at the government tests, you know, they're not super hard to actually meet. You guys are really pushing the bar when it comes to safety. We're kind of looking at everything kind of a little more holistically. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is like, what do consumers really want in their car? Yeah. Certainly they want safety, but there's other things too. So that's kind of our old yeah, little I'd pieces Yeah, I'd say that's, that's actually a big part of our ratings too, right? We do have satisfaction and other reliability right. ratings in, in our score that come into play. Whereas, you know, I would say yours is maybe a little more streamlined safety focused than, than the other aspects that we bring in ours. So again, 
just trying to bring in all the pieces together. And, and, and when you talk about like some of the things that we're giving credit for right now in our overall score, there is certainly the A, B, automatic emergency braking and pedestrian detection in this because you're showing the data. We can see that it really prevents crashes and injury. Um, when it looks like blind spot warning, we're almost more relying on the fact that consumers are saying, I love this feature, love I it. want Same it in my favorite. Car. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think it's important that we have that relationship, right? And we we maximize the impact of our organizations in getting you know that information out. Mm -hmm. So as we start to wrap up here, looking forward, obviously there's so much new technologies coming on board in terms of safety. What is the next big thing? What are you guys looking for going forward, five years down the road? What's going to really change the market? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're going to continue to push uh, our front crash prevention. Um, Looking at new targets, um, you know, bicycle crashes is a big one that yeah. you know, we probably look at. Um, we're starting to see more vehicles with like left turn assist, you know, oncoming motorcycles or oncoming cars. So we'll look at how well systems can work in those. Um, the other thing that we've talked a lot about recently, it's been a lot in the news, you guys have done a lot, is, is automation in vehicles, right? And, yeah. and right now, our data is not showing safety benefit for those above and beyond the crash avoidance features we know work. And so... Um, we're going to continue to monitor that. Our big concern is that, you know, manufacturers will implement those type of systems without doing a good enough job at monitoring the driver. So they'll, they'll be giving the vehicle more control, but not making sure that the driver is still engaged. And so that's one of the areas we're a little bit concerned with and we'll continue to monitor. And, and CR has done a lot of work in that area as well. Yeah, so similar answer, I think, for us, too. Looking at the driver is, is kind of what we're focused on right now, right? Yeah. So monitoring the driver while they're using some of those automated driving assistance features, right? Lane centering, adaptive cruise control, maybe in combination together, but also looking at other characteristics of driver behavior, distraction, drowsiness, sure. you know, impairment for drugs and alcohol and things like that, too. And so I think that's, you know, the driver is kind of coming to the yeah. forefront in some of the stuff we're looking at right now. And one thing I'll mention, you know, we've crashed cars for a while. You know, we're really trying to look at like the whole system, right? And that includes the car, the driver, but also the infrastructure, right? The roads right. that we have, intersections, mm -hmm. those type of things. And so it really is the, the entire system that we want to look at. A lot of opportunity to save lives for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having us. Please check out consumerreports.org. You can see all of our information as well as a lot of the IHS information, or you can actually go right over to IHS.org and you can just see kind of behind the scenes and a lot of the detail of what these guys do. See you next time.